All right, thanks everybody for tuning in. Today, we're very excited to have Quentin Franson from University of Santa Barbara. He's going to tell us about quasi-normal modes from Penrose Limits. So take it away, Quentin. OK, thank you, Dan. Thanks a lot uh, for having me. And indeed, I will talk to you about this recent work uh, that I did, which has the same title as written here, Quasi-Normal Modes from Penrose Limits. However, before getting to this very general or very specific context of the quasi-normal modes, I would like to put this in a somewhat more general context, namely, you know, a problem which I'm, I'm supposing many of you have faced at some point or another. Say I give you some general space-time, which could be quite complicated, and some linear wave equation on this space-time. You know, what to do with this, how to approach this. And one way you could do it if the wavelengths are short with respect to the other scales in your problem is you could first try to get an intuition for the problem and approximate it in some way through a geometrical optics approximation, which in general would give to you to leading order some Hamilton Jacobi equation let's say for the null geodesics of the space-time and in addition you would get some transport equations along this null geodesic uh, for some subleading orders or perhaps how the spin evolves and the idea of what i would like to do is try to understand this from a more space-time perspective because if i give you such a null geodesic let's say one of these leading order solutions to this hamilton jacobi equation there is a procedure by penrose known as the penrose limit which gives you from this null geodesic within the space-time a plane wave space-time which is a lot simpler and on which you can also consider the wave equation and the idea will be that this captures essentially uh, at least uh, to first subleading order the geometric optics approximation and provides uh, a space-time perspective on this. And so this is essentially the plan. First, I will talk to you about some of these aspects of this uh, space-time perspective, namely how this Penrose limit works, what these plane wave space-times are in case you're not familiar with them. And then I will, instead of formally trying to match the two, I will uh, apply this specifically to the problem of quasi-normal modes, quasi-normal modes, which are the free, let's say, perturbations on a black hole background and which are being observed and now true gravitational wave experiments. Although, just to emphasize again, I will only be looking at them in a high real frequency approximation, namely uh, the limit in which the geometrical optics approximation uh, is supposed to be valid. In the end, of course, I will end with some conclusions and I will try to convince you that this is actually a very useful perspective to have on this geometrical optics limit. And one aspect of this, which I would already like to highlight now, is that I think exact plane gravitational wave solutions are useful and of observational interest. Now, I'm sure at some point in my life, someone at some Zoom talk must have emphasized this, but you know, these Zoom talks, you get distracted by emails and whatnot. So let me stress it here uh, in the very beginning. Exact plane gravitational wave solutions not in the way that you typically encounter them as textbooks describing gravitational waves. You know, the, the gravitational waves we see in our detectors are very well described by the linearized approximation. But in the context of this Penrose limit are, I think, a very much of observational interest. OK, so having said this, uh, let me not apologize for starting with some textbook material because I'm not very familiar with the audience and it's always good to refresh a bit. And also, I like very much uh, a particular sentence which Meisner, Wheeler and Thorne use to introduce the plane wave space times, which is that they are a compromise between realism and complexity. And I think they're indeed a very good compromise between realism and complexity. So, uh, I don't quite use uh, the, the notation anymore of Meisner, Wheeler, and Torn, but a plane wave space-time, you might write it down as this. This is sort of uh, the most natural thing. The ansatz, I think, most people would write down if they're familiar with linearized gravitational wave um, transverse traceless perturbations. Namely, you have some U and your V, your, uh, let's say, retarded and advanced coordinates, let's say T plus the propagation direction, Maybe we can call it Z, T minus the propagation direction. And then you have these transverse coordinates Y and this gamma providing you some information or containing sort of the information on your gravitational wave. So these are known as Rosen coordinates, um, but I won't actually 
use typically the plane wave space time in these rows and coordinates rather uh, I will always be writing it in Brinkman coordinates in which uh, sort of the non-trivial aspects of your gravitational wave the way it deviates from flat space is encoded in this a a b so just to reiterate this little a and little b run over the transverse directions which are these x a and this x b and then you have u sort of the coordinate along the plane wave so you have the change in the profile this a is the still dependent on you and that's quite important so generally i will often suppress this uh this dependence but just important to realize that most things will still depend on this u coordinate and then you have v which is uh you know associated to covariantly con co covariantly constant vector in this space time now the relation between the space times given that uh, i won't really use the rosen coordinates is not very important but let me quickly uh, show it for you anyway so you have some type of uh, frame fields to trivialize let's say this this transverse metric and then in order not to have the cross terms because of this u dependence this has to satisfy some additional properties and specifically if i can point your attention to this right corner there's some type of harmonic oscillator relation uh, with this E and then what acts as the frequency matrix, this uh, A uh, of uh, of the Brinkman coordinate spacetime. And so the fact that this is sort of a harmonic oscillator equation, or oh, maybe to say the dots, given that uh, the dependence of these functions is always on U, the dots mean derivatives with respect to this U. And the fact that this harmonic oscillator equation shows up is sort of one of the key features of why these are nice spacetimes, these plane waves, namely, they are in a very real sense, the harmonic oscillators of spacetimes. And so if physics is indeed mostly about understanding harmonic oscillators, I think it's always a good idea if we can uh, reformulate our problems in terms of these harmonic oscillators. Plane wave spacetimes are the harmonic oscillators of spacetimes, which concretely means if I look at the null geodesics on such a spacetime, they're governed by the harmonic oscillator equation. So for these transverse coordinates, of course, you also have the other coordinates, but they're sort of trivial once you're able to integrate this equation. If you look at the wave equation, let's say here just uh, a scalar wave equation where I've separated the v coordinate, which is uh, which you can always do because it's uh, covariantly constant, and this PV associated momentum uh, essentially plays the role of your Planck constant in what how this wave equation is essentially the quantum harmonic oscillator, and then also on the level of the isometries of the spacetime, this is the the Heisenberg algebra, and so also just. As a whole, you can think of this spacetime as uh, the harmonic oscillator of spacetimes. Now, okay, if you're familiar with the concept, you can also rephrase this into saying that the plane wave spacetime is the Eisenhardt Duval lift of uh, the harmonic oscillator. So if you're not familiar with this concept, it's not really important. But the idea is that if I give you some simple dynamical system, with some potential V, then I can always rephrase the problem in terms of this type of geometry where the null geodesic equation is essentially giving you solutions to your uh, dynamical system. And so for the harmonic oscillator, this would be the plane wave spacetime. Now, in general, the plane wave, the spacetimes you get from doing such an Eisenhardt Duval lift might not be the most interesting spacetimes, but it is true that if then I would give you a null geodesic in such an Eisenhardt Duval lift, you could say, well, as in the dynamical system, I could do some perturbation around this null geodesic and my dynamical system around uh, this solution would look like a harmonic oscillator. And so you have a reduction from this uh, null geodesic in the Eisenhardt Duval lift of a more general dynamical system to the plane wave spacetime and in fact even for more general spacetimes which perhaps i cannot write as such an eisenhardt duval lift there is such a procedure where if i give you a null geodesic i can take a type of limit zooming in on this null geodesic and getting a plane wave spacetime and this is exactly what the penrose limit does for you so this is a, a quite uh, old concept and this is really why i believe that uh, aside from being very simple the harmonic oscillators of spacetime these plane waves are also actually quite useful and there's some connection to realism because there's always uh, this limit where you can get from a potentially very complicated spacetime to such a plane wave given by the penrose limit so does that oh yeah please the ball lift uh automatically satisfy the einstein equation? no 
no, no. So this is why, in general, I don't. I mean, I'm not. I've never worked with these things, but in general, I don't think you naturally you automatically get a very nice space time. So in general, this might not be uh, a natural thing to do or or a useful thing to do. Okay. Thanks. Um, oh, oh. By the way, I can because you asked the question, right? You can also ask in this terms of Brinkman coordinates. When does this guy satisfy the Einstein equation? And uh, specifically, the vacuum Einstein equation will require this A matrix to be traceless. So I will. I might mention this later. But so, if you would want to know uh, if you have vacuum Einstein equations, this uh, A in the Brinkman coordinates is traceless. Okay, good. So there are several pro approaches to the Penrose limit. Uh, the one I will present to you and which I quite like is an approach by Blau, Frank and Weiss, which essentially tries to rephrase what exactly this Penrose limit is in terms of Fermi normal coordinates based on the given null geodesic, which is the required input to take this Penrose limit. So Fermi normal coordinates in general, the idea is that I give you some geodesic. Typically, they're introduced actually for time-like coordinates. So let's say, well, a time-like geodesic. Uh, and you uh, make your coordinates such that uh, the Christoffel symbols all vanish on that geodesic. So essentially, uh, you have this coordinate. You, have a, you set up a frame along this geodesic, and you shoot out orthogonal uh, geodesics to sort of uh, span the whole space-time. So for this point x, you would connect it to this time-like curve with a geodesic intersecting this curve orthogonally. And, uh, you know, in terms of the frame on this, you parallel transport it along this uh, geodesic, you would construct the coordinates of this X. Now, a similar procedure works for the null case. Now, the null cases are typically a bit more, comp you know, at least a bit more confusing. But so the main difference is, of course, you start with a null frame and you have to be a bit more careful about what you mean with this orthogonal intersection, because, of course, the inner product with sort of the tangent along this line um, uh, for, it, uh, for it to be zero or for how exactly this should work, uh, you should use actually the complementary null vector to define what are the orthogonal directions rather than uh, in, as in the time-like case, the tangent itself. But otherwise, you can do the same thing. You can uh, define these coordinates and expand the metric in the coordinates, in these null Fermi coordinates based on the null geodesic. And uh, to second order, you would get something like this. So the first line is just flat space. So we have these U and these V, the coordinates based on sort of the null directions of the frame you erected on this null geodesic. And then these XAs again being the transverse directions. The first correction comes in at second order, essentially by construction, right? Because the linear order was made uh, to vanish by the choice of coordinates. Now here, I've, I'm using this notation where the bars over these transverse coordinates also include the V coordinates, and you can do the expansion. And at the second order, the obstruction, let's say, to making it vanish more are uh, these specific contractions of, of the Riemann tensor, which is uh, with the uh, frames on your null geodesic associated to these directions, these transverse directions and these V directions. And so the projections of your Riemann tensor on those directions and the evaluation on this time, like, uh, sorry, in this case, the null, null geodesic. Okay, and you can continue this expansion, but for us, uh, this, this first correction will be all we need. And specifically, the idea of the Penrose limit is that you then assume a particular type of scaling with these uh, Fermi coordinates, Fermi normal coordinates, which remains global in U. So U is still uh, the general U along this null geodesic, but you're zooming in in the orthogonal directions in, in a way that uh, this V and this X go to uh, the geodesic. So with this particular scaling, and if you do this counting uh, here for the for this expansion of the metric in the Fermi normal coordinates, you see that this null piece scales with lambda square. So this is scaled out also here. By the way, comes into the metric. This is the first order, so the first order of this. But there's another piece in the second line which also scales like the lambda square, which is this first R U A bar U B bar, where 
uh, if you choose specifically the transverse corners. So you pick up two lambdas, the U doesn't scale. And so indeed, this first term uh, is also of leading importance. And this is how uh, you recover sort of uh, the plane wave spacetime from this perspective. And so this is uh, what the Penrose limit gives you. Specifically, and this is important or will be important later, I guess, to make the connection to how you usually view uh, the geometrical optics approximation. And it's the first correction to this is that this matrix A in the plane wave spacetime is determined essentially by the geodesic deviation around uh, the chosen null geodesic. Okay, good. So that was uh, the Penrose limit. And th this means that essentially you can think of the Penrose limit as zooming in on a null geodesic. And to the extent then that the physics around the null geodesic controls the physics of interest, uh, you could say that these plane wave space times are actually uh, realistic and, and relevant. And I would like to uh, give sort of a, I think a very cute example of of the extent to which this works, to which null GD6 are indeed controlling much of the physics. Um, presumably, you know, if you've ever done a, a WKB approximation or a geometrical optics approximation, you will know that often many interesting features are captured by this type of approximation or by the null GD6. But let me give the example of a wave scattering on a black hole background. So the idea is we have this asymptotically ingoing wave, we scatter it on the black hole and we see what is the outgoing wave. And if you then ask specifically about, you know, the, the inelasticity, let's say, how much is the black hole absorbing, uh, then the profile of this um, absolute value of this reflection or what captures this inelasticity for different uh, partial waves. So this L's are essentially determining sort of the angular profile of this, uh, of this wave you're scattering. And so it has just a very simple uh, step function form. Essentially, uh, with the idea that, um, you know, okay, so how do you understand this? Well, there is some critical impact parameter if you look at the light GD6 on this black hole background, where if you have a, a larger impact parameter, you will just scatter. Uh, while if you have a smaller impact parameter, you will reach really the black hole in the horizon and it will be absorbed. And so essentially, the point of this transition is governed by this critical impact parameter and sort of how broad the transition is is uh, governed by small deviations around this. So this is just uh, one example. You could give a lot of how, you know, you might, uh, what could look like a priori difficult aspects of a wave equation, how easily you can understand their qualitative features and much of them with just looking at, at the null geodesics. Okay, so the previous picture was a bit uh, busy maybe. So this is just the same thing uh, for just one specific L mode. So maybe I should have said this on the, in the beginning at the x-axis, you just have the frequency dependence. And so the y-axis is this uh, this reflection coefficient. Okay, I'm so that, oh yeah, sorry. Why that works so well, even at small values of L? Well, it becomes a bit worse. I mean, uh, if you look at this first one where I dotted this line, it's not quite in the middle and okay. Right, so I will show you some plots later for the quasi-normal modes where you can sort of see more clearly how well it actually works. Uh, but it, it is true that it it, uh, it doesn't work as good as you might want it to uh, in the low in the low frequency limit. Uh, yeah, so already in this this third one where actually I drew the lines, you can see that it's sort of not as good as if if you would take this last one where it really looks more. You know, centered on on where the actual transition point is, but qualitatively the behavior is still very similar. And in this sense, uh, I think it's always a, a useful approximation to have in mind. Um, okay, good. So, I mean, if I just plot the absolute value, you sort of miss that there's also a, a lot of interesting elastic scattering going on, uh, which you could also often try to understand uh, in terms of the null GD6, but. I won't go there. Let me instead just uh, focus on one particular example where I would like to apply this idea of the geometrical optics approximation and in, in particular, the space-time perspective on it, which are the quasi-normal modes. 
And if you, you think about the wave scattering problem, uh, then the quasineural modes are associated to poles in this R in the frequency plane, where essentially, uh, effectively, you you get actually that you just have an outgoing wave, which is the quasineural mode condition of just being free excitations of this black hole going into the horizon uh, and just going out to infinity. So, okay. This brings me to the actual application. So at this point, I've just told you a bit about a Penrose limit in case you didn't know. I've sort of uh, told you that plane waves are the harmonic oscillators of space times, if you didn't know already. And now instead of formally trying to show uh, that this Penrose limit together with the wave equation on it sort of capture the geometrical optics approximation, I will very particularly apply this uh, to the case of quasi-normal modes, quasi-normal modes which have a long history of being understood, at least uh, in some way, in terms of the geometrical optics approximation. So I just list two references here. Uh, there are many, many more, of course, but it's quite nice that sort of spans 40 years. And this last paper in particular uh, deals with Kerr black holes, which are still quite non-trivial, even in the geometrical optics approximation. And it's quite nice that, uh, uh, well, it's a very good work, but so their, their, geometrical op their geometrical interpretation of this spectrum is in terms of geodesics. I will sort of bring this a bit more geometrical, even in terms of uh, the plane wave space times associated to the Penrose limit along these geodesics. Okay, good. So I will always be working in, in four dimensions for a Kerr black hole, uh, which is, I think, very reasonable. So they're complicated enough uh, that they're not just as trivial as Schwarzschild, and they are actually of astrophysical relevance. I want to just remind you here of the notation. So I will be working Boyer-Lindquist coordinates. So you have the... Um, the usual time radial coordinate, angular coordinates phi and theta. Then you have the sigma and delta, which are just some functions of R. And importantly, the sigma is still a function of theta. Otherwise, finally, the, the A determines the spin of the black hole. So this is just angular momentum over the mass. And what is interesting when I start trying to apply this whole thing, uh, you know, this notion of using the Penrose limit to understand or as a different point of view on the geometrical optics approximation in the context of quasi-normal modes is that there's always this sense which in the quasi-normal modes, you not only have to be able to solve in some way the wave equation, you also have to tell me how should I impose in this way uh, the boundary conditions, right? So when I show you this diagram, it sort of gives you a prescription of perhaps how to approach the wave equation, but I still need to tell you how we will impose uh, in this approximation, the correct boundary conditions, which is outgoing at infinity and ingoing at a horizon. And at the level of, uh, first of all, the basis, the basic null geodesic on which you would like to apply this Penrose limit, it sort of uh, seems obvious also in hindsight, because of course, this is what geometrical optics people have been doing for a long time, that you have to look at the bound a spherical null geodesics around the Kerr black hole because you don't want them to come from the horizon in the far past. You don't want to want them to come to infinity. You just want them to to have been in the space time, let's say. So it seems natural, and this is also what people do in the geometrical optics approximation to indeed consider these spherical null geodesics. But it has to be emphasized, I guess, that if you would consider a more complicated space-time, something with more structure rather than just a horizon and this asymptotic infinity. Of course, there could be more interesting geodesics contributing uh, to your understanding of the quasi-normal modes. And this is, for instance, something that people might emphasize uh, if you have some, some additional structure close to the horizon and you get some type of trapped modes which are long-lived, then of course you would also have to sort of consider the geodesics going from the light ring to the structure and, and intermediate. So, okay, in general this choice could be quite complicated. For black holes in particular, it's really the spherical null geodesics uh, which will be the appropriate choice and so which we will be using to do this Penrose limit with. So these uh, spherical geodesics, okay, they have some impact parameter and some Carter constant. Motion on a curved space-time is completely integrable, so I, they have a constant radius. Uh, the specific expression for the impact parameter and the Carter constant in terms of this radius are not very important. What is important is that uh, the motion is still quite non-trivial even for this constant R because you still have this nice theta dependence, the non-trivial polar behavior uh, in this Kerr case. 
Now, the next step, uh, having fixed the appropriate geodesic, is to construct the Penrose limit. Now, in this earlier uh, part, I reviewed how, at least from this perspective of the null Fermi normal coordinates, you obtain the Penrose limit. And the non trivial aspect of this was finding specific projections of the Riemann tensor along the null geodesic. So to do this, you need some type of parallel transported frame along the geodesic. Um, and this can be quite complicated, but for Kerr, this has been worked out uh, by these people, explicitly exploiting the symmetry structures of the Kerr black hole. And so what I mean when I say this is that essentially you use the killing tensors, the conformal killing Yano tensor and uh, and this type of thing to construct from this one geodesic, sorry, the U, this one uh, vector you already have because it's the tangent to your null geodesic, the remainder of your null frame uh, on which you will base uh, your null Fermi normal coordinates and in turn you will use to get this Penrose limit. Okay, so, okay, I shouldn't probably have uh, put on the slide all this formula here, but just to, to tell you, you can do this very explicitly in full generality for Kerr, exploiting the fact that it has uh, this additional hidden symmetry, this conformal killing Yano tensor. So you can build up this entire frame. Quentin, can I ask uh, a question? Sure, sure, sure. So, uh, so uh, this has been worked out in Borel Lindquist coordinates? Um, or... You mean uh, this frame and well, yeah, you can you can phrase it. You, you can uh, put it in Borel Lindquist. So this original paper I'm referring to is is fairly abstract mm. um, okay. in terms of their notation and treating in full generality, uh, you know, this uh, this whole type of metrics uh, to which you can you have this type of canonical form of the metric and uh, which admits this type of uh, of killing killing structure. But you can work it out and in the paper I've, uh, well, okay, I guess I, I haven't given explicitly what, what the vectors are because they're, they're quite a bit of a mess, uh, but you can put it in Mathematica and find, yeah, find yeah. what they are. No, I was just wondering whether, whether it would be, I mean, I was just wondering whether, I mean, if you're saying that really the symmetries and the killing Yano is important for that, maybe it would be to... nicer in a uh, shield coordinates. Right, uh, yeah. So uh, whatever coordinates you want to use. So um, of course, also, I mean, I have to say, so here you really make use of this integrability of the curve background. But in general, I can, if I give you a null geodesic, I start, you know, with some frame at some point, I can just integrate the equations to get it everywhere. It's just if you want nice analytic expressions, presumably, you know, you have to exploit some of the symmetry structure. But in terms of understanding this Penrose limit or uh, actually even the general geodesic geometric optics approximation, there's no need to, to use all this type of machinery. You can just pick a point on your uh, null geodesic, erect a frame, integrate it along the whole null geodesic and uh, use that. Uh, but okay, so I'm confused by this. Thanks. Yeah, this, this might be my ignorance, but can you? I, I thought to construct a frame, you can take the the tangent to be the time lag, so you yeah. let e zero mu be u mu. Yeah, and then that's you the have choice. To yeah. pick three other mm -hmm. uh, components. If you want it to be an orthonormal frame, you pick them such that the you know e a e b is delta a b, and you're done. Why why do you need to do anything more? Do you want your frame vectors to actually obey some other equation? You want them to be parallel transported. You want the whole frame to be parallel transported along your null geodesic. Uh, okay, so stupid question. What happens if you don't do that? If you just pick some four? Uh, I mean, locally at every point, you can just define a new frame, if you will. You can just have a, I see. So you want, yeah, where does that come in? What, what what's the where do you need the the where does the equation that the frame fields have to be parallel transported come in? Into well, frame? so in some sense, if they're not, I mean, you you might okay. Let's start. Let's say you do Fermi nor, Fermi normal coordinates for a time like case. Uh, 
there you would also want parallel transported frame. And if, if you don't, it's sort of like an acceleration or something like this, and you, you would get uh, linear orders in this expansion of the metric around these coordinates. So you would you would feel some type of acceleration or some type of rotation, uh, effectively doing the same thing, and I don't think you would have a normal coordinates where which start at second order. I, I see. That's the thing I'm missing. You specifically right. want these. Okay, also, that's the thing I was missing. Okay. If I can sort of go all the way back, uh, I'm not sure that's a good thing to do. Typically, it's not. But if I if you think about how this translation works from Rosen coordinates to Brinkman coordinates. In some sense, it's setting up this type of frame uh, that is this uh, coordinate transformation. And here, these extra conditions, for instance, uh, this middle one are sort of things that are implied that are satisfied specifically also if this E is in some sense parallel transported uh, along this, uh, this U line, coordinate line. Um, so, so it does come in and it, it is important for the construction. Um, okay, yeah, thank you. Now, this being said, actually, in things in very symmetric cases like Schwarzschild, I think actually you can get away with not <laughs> imposing this. Uh, so, okay, but in general, it's it's important. Okay, let me see where I was. Uh, and and these people have done this so that you can do it in uh, you know nicely construct this analytically with relatively compact expressions. If you want to, if you try to write this out in coordinates, it will become very nasty. But, you know, at least in terms of these abstract structures, it's, uh, it's very yeah, nice. So just to make sure I understand, yeah. you're allowed to write any orthonormal frame that you want. It doesn't have to be parallel transported, but here you specifically want one that uh, is in Riemann normal coordinates or for me, whatever they're called. Yeah, yeah. So to do this pen that's, that's why it's a hard, do. you have to actually yeah. solve an equation. Okay. Yeah, exactly. I, I didn't understand it. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, you're welcome. But okay, so the specific form here is not important. I just wanted to actually give you the Schwarzschild example, what this then actually looks like. So you have this U, uh, the tangents or associated to the tangent along your null geodesic just going, you know, cylindrically. Uh, in the time and phi direction, you have the complementary null direction essentially using the same coordinates. And then your orthogonal directions are just radially away from this null geodesic and then in the, the opposite polar angle. So, you know, if you're thinking practically, I will show you the end result of the plane wave when you do this limit in Kerr. But practically for the equatorial case in Kerr and for Schwarzschild, just to get an impression, what you can think of is as this first coordinate sort of being in the radial direction and the second transverse coordinate sort of being in the other, uh, you know, in the angular direction perpendicular to your, uh, to your null geodesic. But okay, this is what you get uh, when you go through all this motion, you construct this frame, you take the projections of your Riemann tensor, then the leading order, uh, in this particular scaling of the null Fermi normal coordinates around the spherical geodesic looks like this. It's a plane wave space-time, and you can very explicitly write down this A matrix. It doesn't look too bad, but importantly, actually, this theta uh, that comes in, which is the theta sort of um, of the original non-trivial motion still of your spherical null geodesic is dependent on you, which makes the whole problem uh, quite a bit more complicated. In general, it's some elliptic function. And so uh, so it's a very easy space-time. It's a plane wave, a harmonic oscillator space-time, but it's not entirely trivial. Okay, so now we've gone through the whole construction of making this space-time. We can finally sort of get to the wave equation on the space-time and trying to see if we can actually get um, quasi-normal modes from this. So for the purpose of the paper and, and this talk, I've just been uh, discussing, or I will just discuss the massless scalar wave equation. In principle, this should also work for, uh, you should be able to do it for, for gravity, um, but at least to leading order in the um, the geometric optics approximation, there, there shouldn't be a difference. So this is a good first case to work out. And as I mentioned earlier, the wave equation on the plane wave spacetime is simply a quantum harmonic oscillator. So let's say insert your favorite solution to the harmonic oscillator here. But you will complain to me because I missed an important part. So I have to, of course, also tell you how do I actually impose boundary conditions? Because it's a bit strange in the sense that um, 
it's it doesn't own, it's a harmonic oscillator. The general frequency matrix for Kerr depends on time. That's maybe not the weirdest part. You also have uh, that there's an, an ima or an, a negative entry there. You have uh, negative or imaginary frequencies. Uh, so let's let me just first show you specifically how it works in Schwarzschild because there we can be very explicit. So in Schwarzschild you can nicely separate all the coordinates, the matrix uh, determining the plane wave spacetime is diagonal, and by the Einstein equations actually the one one uh, component is minus the A22 component. So this is what I mentioned. Imposing the vacuum Einstein equations means that this vec that this matrix is traceless. And so I get two harmonic oscillators, one for each of the directions. But while one of them, the stable direction, the theta direction, so uh, the one uh, sort of moving, let's say, your null geodesic is a nice, uh, nice Gaussian. And you can say, OK, I want a solution that is localized on this null geodesic. So I just pick asymptotically that it is decaying in this x2 direction, which is the stable uh, angular direction. However, in the unstable direction, you instead get some type of, uh, you get an I in the Gaussian and it represents some type of radiation. So it's the unstable direction. So essentially waves are leaking out from, um, from uh, this spherical null geodesic and you sort of have to impose that they're outgoing. The waves are going away from the spherical null geodesic. So away in the sense that it's outgoing at asymptotic infinity and away in the sense that it's going towards the horizon and it's not coming back. It's being absorbed by the horizon. So, and in some sense, this is sort of the, I think also one of the, the things that is bit, that is, you could say is somewhat appealing with respect to the usual geometrical optics approximation. I'm, I'm not sure how clear this is in that case, how you're actually nicely imposing the right boundary conditions for your, um, for your quasi-normal mode problem, and more is generally, is there any interesting sorry. global structure in this geometry? Like, is there any horizon, ah. or there's just one far region? How does that ah, work? Good. Actually, this is a very confusing point. So, um, maybe I will come to this or aspects of this in the in the well. Okay. So, there's a lot of literature on this plane wave space times. And one part of this literature is actually taking this type of Penrose limit in a holographic context. So let's say in ADS5 cross S5. And, uh, you know, they're trying to establish a holographic correspondence. And so in this context, there has been quite some interest in trying to characterize what is the asymptotic region of this in this plane wave spacetime. And so in a very special case there, there is a, a, a map a conformal map where you sort of can identify that asymptotic boundary of such a plane wave space time is uh, a one dimensional null line. Um, but exactly how this is embedded or how this works is, uh, yeah, is quite confusing, at least to me. But so people have studied this and also in a more general context, if you define in a certain way what is sort of the causal boundary of this thing and it ends up being sort of a, a one dimensional. A null line. So, uh, you know, uh, okay. I'm not sure that, that probably does this, that help a bit. Um, yeah, a little bit. Not. Uh, but, but okay, this is actually another point I would want to make is that, okay, I'm telling you these are the right boundary conditions, but basically it's just telling you about the behavior around uh, this null geodesic. So, right to do this properly, actually, you would need an exterior zone matched to these boundary conditions and show that indeed you can do this matching such that you have in the actual regions sort of the right boundary conditions into the horizon and out to infinity. And so I think, you know, there's, there is some global work that could be done here in terms of making sort of the, the approximation relevant in the, the all the separate regions that are actually needed to impose the right boundary conditions and uh, perhaps when you're thinking about going beyond the sort of leading geometrical optics approximation, there would be a non-trivial interplay between those regions where you do have some type of backscattering and you have to take this into account and have some more non-trivial boundary conditions. But at least uh, to this first subleading order to reproduce um, the results of the geometrical optics approximation, this seems to be the right choice.
And I think this is quite intuitive. Uh, any further questions on this or? Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, please. Have you looked at the symmetries, the isometries of this metric that you get from Zoom? Oh, yeah. So, so what, what let me, maybe I'll, I'll come to back to it in, in two slides. Um, so first, okay, so I guess, uh, okay, I guess this is what I said, right? So you're radiating away from the bound orbit in the unstable direction. You're uh, localized on the reference UG6, so you have a particular choice. And as usual, you know, you impose these boundary conditions and you get a quantization condition uh, on one of these momenta. And, you know, if you think about this, uh, the square roots of uh, of this matrix coming into the Brinkman coordinates, these were related to the geodesic deviation equations. And you will quickly convince yourself that at least, you know, if you translate again to the usual boyer lindquist time, that these will be the usual processional frequency um, around uh, the geodesic and then the Lyapunov exponent uh, of this geodesic. And so you recover the usual geometrical optics results. Um, so now you can do this in the general case, insert your favorite solution to the harmonic oscillator. The main non-trivial piece uh, to the harmonic oscillator is actually just solving the classical equation. And this particularly determines the generators of the isometry algebra. So maybe to come back to the question then, in general, the plane wave spacetime has this Heisenberg isometry algebra of the harmonic oscillator. However, you know, to write down uh, the generators in general, you need to be able to solve uh, this classical harmonic oscillator equation. So uh, to construct them, uh, you, you can construct them, write down general solutions if I give you all the different independent solutions to the harmonic oscillator equation. This is for the most general case, this is the only isometry you have. Um, so this Heisenberg algebra. But okay, you can then, if you have this, so if you solve the classical uh, harmonic oscillator on the, with this given A, then you can write down this isometry algebra, you can construct your raising and lowering operators or however you would like to approach this problem and the problem is essentially solved. Yeah, now, so for, oh, yeah. for one more question. So for, from this perspective, is there something special about the closed photon orbit? No. There isn't. And, no, so exactly. The Penrose limit has the same symmetries no matter what geodesic you zoom into. So it always has this uh, this Heisenberg algebra. In some special cases, it can have more. But, and I think this is actually an interesting thing to point out. So um, the fact that this isometry algebra is there is nothing special about the spherical, uh, about the spherical orbits. If I give you a general uh, null geodesic, can I do this Penrose limit? So if I consider in general around such a null geodesic, um, the physics, you know, on this zoomed in, uh, region, then you do get this this isometry algebra. And so in this sense also, with respect to some of the previous work you did, um, uh, there's not nothing special really in how this arises from the uh, plane, from, let's say, from the fact that you chose the spherical null geodesics. That being said, for Schwarzschild and equatorial Kerr, there is an additional isometry. So uh, it's not just this Heisenberg algebra, you have an additional symmetry sort of along the tangent of your geodesic and actually the plane wave becomes a symmetric space. So maybe to come back to first uh, sort of uh, let me uh, gather where I was, right? So I didn't want to really solve or go through the details of how you explicitly solve uh, this harmonic oscillator. I assume, you know, you can do this. It's just a bit messy for Kerr, uh, but I do want to point out some special aspects. And one of them is that uh, for Schwarzschild, or if you take Kerr in the equatorial case, this matrix A becomes a constant and the plane wave has more than just this Heisenberg isometry algebra. Specifically, it becomes a symmetric space. And so, you know, if you're sitting in the audience and you very much like what you can do in anti de Sitter, let's say, you know, exploiting all its symmetries, but you think, well, maybe uh, this is not the thing that will bring me closest to experiments, I would highly urge you to consider another space, which is essentially as symmetrical. It's a nice uh, symmetric space. It's, you have a, a coset form and whatever, 
uh, for it. And it is, I think, very relevant for observations because it, it captures, for instance, the physics near the slide ring. Okay, so another interesting limit is if you're uh, familiar with this, if I take my Kerr black hole and I take the spin to extremality, this near horizon region develops, which has an emergent symmetry, so has more symmetry than just oh, the Kerr black hole. Oh, sorry. Specifically, it has an SL2R cross cross U1 uh, enhanced symmetry, and uh, the null, the co-rotating null geodesic is within this near horizon region, which has this additional symmetry. And so uh, within this limit, you have more control of your wave equation in any case, even before doing any type of geometrical optics approximation. And you can very nicely see how um, when you look at the at this at these general solutions, you know, within this near horizon region, and then you sort of uh, try to expand around this geometrical optics approximation or this Penrose limit and see how this emerges. You can very nicely see how this happens and how the symmetries of this full near horizon region contract uh, to the Heisenberg algebra. So, so, but there's no statement that taking the Penrose limit of the co-rotating photon orbit gives you neck. It's you started off on neck. Okay. Yeah. So you, um, you don't get get neck neck in full. Um, it's just a, a a nice setting where you can sort of because you have more control, as you undoubtedly know about the full wave equation. You can sort of more nicely see how it happens that this near horizon region, or sorry, the the near photon ring region emerges from this full solution, uh, but. You know, when you're thinking about the full Kerr solution, there is still a very non-trivial direction also in the near horizon region, which is this polar direction. And this is the same type of non-trivial aspect you still have for the full photon ring region around the spherical orbits in a Kerr black hole. So in this sense, you know, uh, both cases are, you know, somehow having still this, uh, this difficult direction. And so you don't gain too much from looking at this... Um, Penrose limit in the near horizon region as opposed to the Penrose limit in the Kerr black hole. On the other hand, that's that's the reason why it's interesting, right? I don't have to care, you know, I don't have to find a near extremal black hole in the universe for this uh, to be an irrelevant, irrelevant type of analysis. Do you happen to know uh, if the killing tensor becomes reducible in this limit? The, in the, the Penrose limit, you mean? Yeah. I, yeah, I think it is. I haven't done it explicitly, uh, but my assumption is that it is. But I, I have to say, I haven't explicitly looked at how it, it reduces. So, uh, But you yeah, think you could I write think... it in terms of the Heisenberg uh, isometries? This is what I would think, yeah, that we would also have some type of uh, reduction there, yeah. But okay, so I haven't done it explicitly, so I don't want to say it with full certainty, but I, I think this is fair. I think what we're all after is understanding what are the killing vector fields of these geometries. So if I understand correctly, there's always at least two okay, associated okay. with the plus Sorry. and minus. Let me, there's always at least one. I'm sorry, I'm going back. Uh, but it's really the the type of symmetries you would have in a, in a harmonic oscillator. So, okay. So you always have the V direction. So this is covariantly constant. In this background, uh, you always have this guy. So the partial V. And then the other ones, QA and PB, um, I haven't written them down explicitly here. I, I Maybe I should have, but you, you have a construction of them if I give to you solutions to this classical harmonic oscillator equation. Um, so I, I can give you a reference, but so there, in general, you know, if you have an A, which depends on oh, you non so The Heisenberg algebra has A plus, A minus in the identity, and the identity is like DV, and then there's two others? Yeah. Yeah, I see. It. For for each when, two others for each orthogonal direction, uh, I guess. So if you're in say Schwarzschild, shield, then you the A I Js don't depend on you. Then you also have D U. Exactly. That, that's that's exactly. so you get one extra guy. Yeah, and that's what makes it into a, you know, why it's uh, this enhanced symmetry. Yeah. And what is the I, algebra? Does I guess the D U commutes with D V. Does it commute with Q and P? No, no. Um, it doesn't so commute with them, no. Um, so what's it the acts algebra? sort of like the like a Hamilton 
Newtonian with respect to them. So sort of, uh, I guess if you act on Q, you would get a P. And if you act on P, you would get uh, this A matrix times Q, something like this. So it's um, like how you would, you know, you do a Poisson bracket with your Hamiltonian with respect to your position or your momentum. Yeah, so, so you're saying in that case, you get one extra killing vector field. And if you're incurred, there is no extra killing vector field. Yes. You have that discrete symmetry. The, yes. The periodicity. Okay, thank you. That's my understanding in any case, yeah. And so this algebra you have wherever you take your Penrose limit. Um, okay. Okay, so sorry for skipping all the way back. Um, I was just going to tell you about the generic case then. So, okay, you had these special cases for the generic Kerr. Um, I guess you can just integrate the equations. You can also notice that this A is still periodic. And so you have this notion that um, there is this Floquet theorem, which tells you that you can sort of separate out uh, an exponential piece, uh, which uh, with this K sort of captures what you would like to know about your Lyapunov exponent, say, and then you have a remaining piece that is uh, periodic with respect to just a period of this A. And so from the from the K, this uh, Floquet Lyapunov exponent, you can extract what in the uh, Schwarzschild case you would have easily read off just from your A. Uh, in this case, it's a bit more tricky, but sort of this K plays the role that uh, sort of the the trivial behavior in the Schwarzschild case would have just easily been read off from the eigenvalues of your A. And you can do the whole, uh, you can just integrate numerically. This is what I did. You know, it would be interesting if if you figure out that actually the Kerr, Kerr case is very nice and there is some solution, but uh, I tried a bit and I didn't find anything analytic. So I just integrated the equation and used some of these properties to extract eventually what we need to know about the quasi-normal modes. But there is an important piece still missing. So I have done just this near zone analysis, showed to you how um, you have these natural boundary conditions, which impose for you one type of quantization, but to actually get the quasi-normal modes in Boyer-Lindquist time and you know the full matching, you do need to use more information about how this Penrose limit actually is embedded in your spacetime. For instance, thinking about this covariantly constant killing vector you always have, uh, you might wonder, well, we've quantized you know, in the Schwarzschild case where this U was also a killing vector, this PU, but what, what happens uh, to this PV? And it turns out actually that you can't really say anything about this from just the Penrose limit perspective. So here you do sort of need to do the same thing as what you do in the geometrical optics approximation, namely um, this background geodesic is in some sense quantized using the Bohr, in a Bohr-Sommerfeld way, essentially. So um, I guess most of us are most familiar with this in terms of the quantum mechanics and how this is argued there. And in Schwarzschild, you can easily see how this works. Namely, if I write everything in my original coordinates, I want this wave function to be single valued uh, first, let's say, you know, phi to, to phi plus two pi. And this gives me essentially what I would call here the bohr sommerfeld quantization conditions on this PV. And so as in the geometric optics approach, you sort of have an additional constraint. You don't just have these spherical null geodesics, but there's a particular mapping between the angular momentum and uh, the Carter constant, which is consistent with this type of single valuedness. And so, you know, it is true that the region around this photon ring, you understand from the wave equation on this plane wave space-time that emerged in the Penrose limit. But it is important to uh, remember the whole process. You do still need to know things about this background geodesic imposed constraints on it and remember how it was embedded in the full space-time to really get uh, the actual quasi-normal modes. Okay, so... Uh... Depending on the time I have, I will flash for you some numerical results. But in some sense, I mean, these numerical results are capturing, you know, what previous works using the geometrical optics approximation have captured. So the regions in which they work well or don't work very well, uh, there's nothing nothing surprising there. And in general, the conclusion is just that, that, that it works well. So if I, I show you here sort of the... 
the real value and uh, the approximation using this whole approach and going through the machinery of solving this near zone wave equation, doing the quantization of the background geodesic for a, a, a quasi normal mode where this L is high 30, let's say I took the M, the M mode, so which is as a mutual part to be 25. And then the overtones here in the real part actually don't matter too much. So I just show one example. And then you can see at least uh, they capture this quite well. If you do the same for the imaginary part, now you do have the overtone dependence and you can see, for instance, that it works a bit less well, you know, at higher spin in absolute value. Although when you go to this near extremal limit, you do capture uh, the fact that this imaginary part goes to zero, for instance, but the way it approaches the zero is not quite uh, how the numerical values do it. The Schwarzschild case is very easy if you need to sort of have a rule of thumb of what quasi-normal modes look like explicitly or for Schwarzschild and you don't care too much about the details. This form is very nice to remember, but you can see L equals two where you have no, you know, no hope really of this geometrical optics approximation working. It is it is pretty bad, right? It's sort of 30% off. So what I'm showing here on the y-axis is the relative difference between the real part of the frequency computed using this geometrical optics approximation or equivalently the way I actually computed it here is using this Penrose limit as compared to the numerical value. So, okay, at two, you obviously can't use the geometrical optics approximation, but you very quickly, you know, get to 10% level and then, you know, 1% okay. level well, if you're around LS10. This plot makes a very nice point. Is it because you have a line here? Yes. So we expect the correction. You have the yes. leading term, which is O of L, the subleading term, which is O of 1. And you expect the correction to the formula to be O of 1 over L. Yeah. And this looks like so, a, well, a okay. line. Um, sorry. It's a log plot. So it, it's consistent with the correction being of order 1 over L. Exactly. Yeah. So this is why it's, it's plotted in this way. So, um, uh, let's see. Actually, so because it's this this relative thing, so what you capture, you capture the first, the leading order and the first subleading order. So this line actually goes like L to the minus two because you're taking the relative thing. But essentially what you said is true. This is why I plot it this way. And the same thing, actually, okay. So this is the interesting part then. Let's go to the imaginary part. And here actually uh, for Schwarzschild, this goes down faster than you expect. So I will show this more clearly in uh, the more complicated example of Kerr. But the imaginary part, the leading imaginary part, only comes in uh, at the first subleading order. So if you go take ratios, actually, you can only expect the scaling with L to the minus one. And this goes a bit faster than that. So let me maybe, you know, in, in view of time, the, the previous ones are just for the n equals to zero, the, so the fundamental. In general, if you look at higher ends, at least for the real part, it's clear that sort of the approximation becomes worse, but the, the scaling is still as you expect. In the imaginary part, okay, there's some transient behavior, but in the end, if you go to high enough n, indeed sort of the, the approximation becomes worse. Um, these are just the same thing, but for specific mode, uh, in L, namely this this seven, and how it changes when you change the spin of your black hole. But what I guess I want to come to is a more this type of plot, where you see the circles here are for a higher spin, and there you nicely see a scaling on this log plot, which goes like the L minus one, which is actually what you expect is the error you're making on this imaginary part, or at least a relative. Uh, piece of this imaginary part. Well, for the slower spin, actually, you get a bit more uh, than what you strictly would expect based on, on the first subleading correction. So in general, you indeed see that you're capturing um, the right scaling, let's say, of this approximation. You're getting wrong. You're being wrong in the way you expect to be wrong, except in the special case of the imaginary part where it somehow seems that at zero spin, you're sort of doing a bit better than you could have hoped. Uh, but that's that's the main thing I guess I, I need to show with these plots uh, because I think I run, I'm running out of time. Does this uh, satisfy you? 
So just maybe to reiterate, on the y-axis here, I have the relative difference of the imaginary part in a log scale. On the x-axis, I have this L angular uh, quantum number, let's say, which uh, should be large for the geometrical optics approximation to hold. And you indeed see nicely how uh, the approximation improves for higher L. For the imaginary part, the relative piece, because the leading piece only comes in at first subleading order, um, you in general expect the correction to come in at, uh, you know, that your improvement is just L minus one. And this is what you see in general for high enough spin, but somehow you get an L minus two scaling for low spin. So you're doing better uh, than you could have hoped. For the real part, the leading piece does come in at the leading order. And so when you take this ratio in general, you expect uh, this L to the minus two behavior. And this is what you see. And, and Quentin, is, is there, so the spinner is limited. It's effectively, it's equivalent to the geometric optics approximation. The, the information gets prepackaged differently, but does it help yep. you go to high order in perturbation theory? Okay, good. So this is actually a, a question, uh, pr probably an interesting question. So what is this good for? So maybe let me just recap and then try to conclude and sort of ask this question, what is it good for? So essentially what I've tried to do is to give really a geometrical perspective on geometrical optics. So really from the point of view of, of space-time capturing um, this region around a null geodesic is what the Penrose limit does for you. And so uh, this in some way gives you uh, a geometrical perspective on the geometrical optics approximation. Now, important there is the input of this null geodesic, which in some sense comes from the leading order Hamilton-Jacobi equation to this geometrical optics approximation. So this is sort of the same input. You still need solutions to this, and, and it is important what you do there. But then what you're sort of translating is the subleading effects, which would be transport problems along the light ray in the geometrical optics approximation. And you're sort of translating this into physics on plane wave backgrounds. I've applied this to quasi-normal modes and then emphasized, you know, you need the whole this, this whole path, let's say, to the wave equation around the null geodesic. It's not enough to just consider the near zone. And, you know, it's a very fair question to ask, okay, this is very nice. Uh, what do you actually do with this? Because we're rephrasing, you know, the geometrical optics approximation. And I do actually think uh, that it is useful for one thing, I think the way these isometries comes, come out is way more natural here. You, you immediately find them and notice, okay, they're the isometries of this Penrose limit space time. And so the fact that, uh, um, that for instance, Dan, Alex and Shah have been founding these in the, uh, in the differential equations is, is very natural, I think, from this point of view. And I think it's quite insightful to view it uh, in terms of this Penrose limit. In addition, I think it's sort of more natural for a matched asymptotic expansion type approach, because I mean, I'm sure you can do this type of matching where you're sort of trying to include more information about also not just the region around uh, this null geodesic, but also sort of the, the further out regions, which presumably would need or would become interesting uh, if you want certain types of corrections to this geometrical optics approximation. So I think it could be useful there. And also I think, and this is actually what I would be most excited about, is if you could go beyond linear perturbations. So if you have this picture that is very observationally relevant to try to figure out nonlinear corrections to quasi-normal modes, because it lets you go closer to merger. So one way, or this in general seems a quite complicated problem, but if at least in this limit, the quasi-normal modes are peaked around this null geodesic, then it seems natural to first maybe try to understand nonlinear effects in this near zone region. And so I, I would hope that there, this type of perspective would, would be more useful and sort of more natural than trying to figure this out in a geometrical optics approximation, these interactions. And then finally, there's a huge literature on plane wave space times, you know, going from classical GR properties, but also just this uh, high energy physics string theory, even holographic understanding in certain settings, of course, not directly in this astrophysical settings. But I think what is missing in this whole literature is a connection to observation. And I think having in mind that these plane wave space times arise in this setting and are observationally relevant, at least uh, in some level, 
uh, in this way could at least uh, provide a stepping stone if you would want to try to get closer to observations, observations which are, of course, very relevant now being probed, uh, probing, especially, for instance, this light ring in, in ways which were never possible before. And so I think that would be a, a very useful exercise. Okay, that's it. Thank you. All right, let's all thank Quentin for a fantastic talk. Thank you for can, can I ask you one question, Quentin? Sure. First, thank, thank you for the great talk. Um, so we, you're saying that every geodesic, you can zoom in near it, and you get the same Heisenberg algebra that arises. Right. From our perspective, looking at the quasi-normal modes, it was important to get the Heisenberg structure in the wave equation that we zoom in on the on the nearly bound orbits because those were the ones that probed the peak of this radial potential where the where the potential looks like a, an inverted it looks like a parabola which is the inverted harmonic oscillator and that's that's how we understood the oscillators to arise and so uh, the the oscillator in your story is just oscillating kind of around the geodesic that you're looking at. There's nothing special about it. Whereas the, the oscillator algebra we were looking at was specifically tied to the peak of the geodesic potential. And so it only arose for the the light rays that, that orbit. I mean, you're, yeah, you're saying they are the same thing. So well, I guess I mean, the thing that confuses me is that I'm, I'm looking for a way to explain why the well, so I, I mean, there is a there is a big difference, you know. If I give you a quantum mechanics problem, I mean, there's a big difference between the scattering states and the bound states, right? But sort of the um, the special thing there is the the quasi normal modes, the fact that you have these uh, these types of resonances rather than specifically the algebra. So of course, these nicely gather into uh, um, into then you know, a representation of this uh, this algebra, at least in this uh, geometrical optics approximation. Um, but yeah, in general, the algebra is there for general null geodesics. I see. But of so course, quasi-normal modes okay. are still so, special. I see. So from your from your perspective with these Penrose limits, you're saying it's not the symmetry that's special for the nearly bound orbits or the bound orbits. It's the boundary conditions that you get to impose that get you quasi-normal modes. Yeah, in some sense, the fact that you you're discretizing this, right? You don't have a continuous spectrum like you would you like you would often have if you just picked, you know, if I picked a, a random null geodesic. Um... Right. Can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, so, Quentin, thanks for the great talk. Um, so I wanted to ask, so there's, it seems to me like in the, in the quasi-normal mode, the community now, people are also like thinking about non-linearities now, right? And uh, like whether they're really important uh, to understand the signal and the, how, how far back towards the merger you can go, uh, et cetera. But uh, I, like another issue that came up is the issue of overtones, whether it's important to take into account their excitations and uh, so, th does this perspective shed any light on that on that question? Well, it's so really, uh, like, yeah, yeah. So you might imagine also trying to get a, you know, at least a context in which you sort of have more control over this excitation. Yeah, I think this might be something you could try, right? Add a source. You know, what does it mean if a source goes through this photon ring? What is this from the perspective of this Penrose limit, and how is this exciting? Uh, these these modes in this in this limit. I think perhaps this would also give a useful uh, sort of playground for this type of question there. Yeah, but uh, um, but basically but, uh, your but view of the overtones is uh, oh, sorry. Well, I guess people people are now extracting this from full numerical relativity solutions, right? Whether whether or not and to what extent they're excited. And of course, you couldn't do better than this. But if you would want some more analytical control, perhaps. Uh, would be interesting. Right, but, pe but people are it seems to me like people should, uh, like by the question of whether these overtones are even stable in the sense that you perturb ah, the effective. That's a different question. Exactly. Area. Yeah. And um 
so that's quite a different question. And I think there are two answers to this. One of them is, uh, I guess, the, the criticism that is often given to this geometrical optics approximation being that the fact that you get this from specifically the spherical null geodesics is very special to Kerr, right? So if I, you know, modify this a bit, then I can get a completely different spectrum and they're not no longer associated specifically to the spherical null geodesics. Uh, so, so I guess this is, this can be one uh, answer to this. Well, okay. So basically, in your picture, you would need to take a Penrose limit around some other geodesic. In or, order to depending that. on the type of corrections you're looking at, yeah, either looking at different geodesics or being more serious about this matched expansion, right? Mm -hmm. Being more serious about the fact that you need to perhaps have less naive boundary conditions on this photon ring rather than just outgoing. Because perhaps before you get to the horizon, there is some further backscattering and I have to do some non-trivial matching to actually find the right boundary conditions. And from this, for this, I think the Penrose limit perspective here is also more useful, or at least it seems to me easier to do this with this Penrose limit perspective rather than from the geometrical optics approximation. So that's one way you could you could think of incorporating this type of thing. Another thing is that you might say, well, actually, you know, when people think about these echoes, for instance, also when you, this is one way you could drastically change the structure of your quasi-neural modes and the impact of this would be, say, in this late-time echoes. But people have also basically constructed these such that uh, the near-merger, let's say the prompt ring down, as it's sometimes called, is still governed by just this light ring. So, you know, you could also take the perspective that for much of the physics just after the merger, I'm really just interested in the physics around this light ring, whether they're really quasi-normal modes or not. This Penrose limit will sort of let you study the wave equation in this region. So I think that's another. Uh... And I have another question actually about. You're saying basically this Penrose limit doesn't give you any more isometries in the general case. But uh, what, like when you, when you look at a bound uh, photon orbit um, relative to some general photon orbit in a, spa in a general space time, right? Um, that's, that's what I understood. But, um, but basically there is some kind of discrete symmetry, uh, right? Because I would expect yeah. like if I'm looking at a light ray going around curve, then it goes basically back to the same space time. Yeah, so this uh, periodicity- Not the same point, but the same, yeah. Yeah, right. there is a periodicity, and that doesn't buy us too much. Basically, you're saying. Um... Well, so maybe okay. So indeed, so this type of periodicity um, is there, and you know maybe uh, there's something there that can be exploited more than I have done. Uh, so, okay. so it's definitely true that these spherical orbits are still, you know, within the the full set of of orbits, quite special. Um, also, this you know you you guys identified more more interesting features rather than just, you know, just this one isometry algebra, right? So, uh, yeah, it would be interesting to see how also those other aspects are incorporated there. And maybe uh, even in the full Kerr case, you know, there are some surprising aspects that I, you know, didn't figure out and that does give you more analytical control than you expect. Uh, I don't want to rule it out, but I, I don't immediately see how uh, how it emerges aside from this periodicity, maybe, or something like this. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome. All right. If there are no more questions, let's thank Quentin again. Thanks for the great talk. I'll Thanks for having me. Stop the recording. Thank you, Quentin. Bye. Bye.